Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Angie, and I am an alcoholic. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me here and uh, Danny for picking me up at the airport and uh, my daughter Lorraine for coming over with me, to keep me honest. It may come as a surprise to you as it's come to me, but I'm not perfect. (laughs) I threw a slight fit uh, earlier in the week because uh, of the... um, trip that I was going to be take here from Fresno, and uh, I wasn't going to tell you, but my sponsor, who is my new conscience, told me to tell you that I sometimes don't act quite the way I ought to, and uh, one of the reasons is, is because I'm not in any danger of getting well. I, I, st- I stand before you with longevity and sobriety because I didn't die and I didn't drink, and I survived. And that's the only thing that I really have going for me. I'd like to start out by telling you that I am very, very grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I tell you that I'm grateful, it's not just words. I believe that in order to be grateful for myself, I stand up and be counted as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am from Blythe, and you know that you got to be sincere if you come from Blythe. However, my motive for moving to Blythe is, wasn't of the most outstanding, and the reason I am in Blythe is because some of us will go to any length to be married, and I am one of those. Uh, if you don't know where Blythe is, it's in the end of the world just before you, it ends and you fall off into hell, and that's where Blythe is. I'm really from Orange County. A 13 step, my husband. And we'll get that all out of the way here uh, before I ever get to, before I get to the sick part of my story. <laughs> I was born and raised in a little barrio called El Medina. I don't know if you know where El Medina is. It's a little barrio, and for those of you that don't know what a barrio is, it's a little Mexican community. And the days that I was raised there, they didn't let any Anglos in, and they weren't too anxious to come in there either. I was born at a time, a long time ago. I'm, I'm really a young person in an old container, but I still. <laughs> but when I was born, they kept the mothers in the hospital a week. And when they came home with this baby, they still didn't have a name for me. And the reason for that is because my daddy wanted to name me after his girlfriend, and my mother's narrow-minded. I mean, I, I hadn't even been home yet and already got rejected. I had an older sister that was perfect. She was a type that they always told her what to do, and she always did it, and she always did it right, and she screwed it up for me, because I never knew how to be good. I never remembered to be good till after I was bad, and after I was bad, boy, did I think that I should have remembered to be good, and so they were always whipping on me. I was always getting whipped. I didn't know it was called battered children. Well, you know how to hold it against, held it against them people. I didn't know people went to jail for bettering them kids. I just thought that that was because I didn't know how to be good. And uh, they were divorced when I was seven, and, and my mother used to say things to me like, you're just like your father, and I knew what her opinion was of him. <laughs> she still thinks I'm like my father. Uh, in fact, she doesn't think I'm an alcoholic. If I ever go visit her and she's got company, she'll pull me aside and tell me things like, Now, don't you be telling them people you're an alcoholic. She she doesn't like for me to embarrass her, right? And she says, you're not an alcoholic. You were always that way. And she'll she'll tell me, you know, she's really good at at taking my inventory. When I'll tell her some of the things that happened to me throughout my life, in my drinking life, her eyes will get real big and she'll say, well, if you're an alcoholic, you don't get it from my side of the family. And so, you know, that was the way I, I grew up. It always know when I was different and unwanted and there was something wrong with me. And that uh, there, everybody else had the secret on how to be good except me. So she would send me to the nuns so they could teach me to be a lady. And what the nuns thought was a lady wasn't appealing to me then and isn't appealing to me now. <laughs> because, 
Look, I told you I didn't know how to be good, and I also don't ever didn't even know how to uh, do the things that people told me to do. In fact, the only thing I knew how to do was to do the things that they didn't tell me that they told me not to do. I was the type of a little kid that I may not have thought of doing it, but as soon as they said, "Thou shalt not." I had an overwhelming desire to do it. It would get in my head, and I couldn't get it out till I did it. I'm still that way. I'm a lot that way even today. It's don't tell me not to do something, because God, I'll zero in on it and get obsessed with it right away. So somebody dared me, and I raised the nun's skirt, see what she wore under all them clothes, and they 86 me from catechism. And I got home and got my whipping. Yeah, just like that. You get your whipping and then everything's all right. And when I got to school the next day, all the kids thought I was terrific. You should have seen all the attention I got at school. Everybody was pointing me out as somebody that, that, that did things uh, that other people didn't have the nerve to do. And it filled up some of them empty places. Because, you see, I think I was born with an emptiness in my soul. A yearning, a hunger, a longing to be loved, to be wanted, to be accepted. And as a child, I used to worship my mother and want her attention and love so bad. And it seemed that no matter what I do, did, it, I never could measure up to what was expected of me. So when I had all that attention, it filled out some of them empty places. I'm one that believes that I always had the pilot lift. All I ever needed was the fuel. And what I did is I ran off to be with my daddy when I was 12 years old. Uh, over in the San Fernando Valley, where my daddy had taken up lighthouse keeping with a lady with eight kids. And all he wants is one more, right? And here comes trouble. And the thing about that was significant about that little journey of mine, or early geographic, whatever you want to call it, is that my daddy used to take people up north to the San Fernando, uh, to uh, over here down this way, to pick grapes and prunes. And we were fruit pickers. And you know, God made two kinds of Mexicans. That's fruit pickers and non-fruit pickers. And I'm not a fruit picker. They tried to make a fruit picker out of me. And it didn't take. In fact, there was, nothing ever takes unless I want it to. But I'll tell you what took. We stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers. It was over here in Livingston. And those days it was the middle of nowhere. I don't know if it still is. I don't want to ever find out about that place. Anymore. We stayed beyond the season with the Gallo brothers, and they gave my dad a case of sherry wine, and somebody must have said, thou shalt not. I get ahead a big water glass of that sherry wine, and when it went down and hit my stomach, everything felt good. I mean, I loved it. It's just too bad something that good has to be wasted on social drinkers that don't appreciate it. God, I loved it. I mean, it did something for me that was terrific. Now, anything going to make me feel that good, I want more. And then it's the next day, because I always overshot the goal trying to keep the goal. It was really surprising to me that anything that good that would come to the next day going to make me feel so bad. I mean, really bad. I had my, st- my hair stuck to my face where I threw up all over myself, and, and my clothes are torn where I got in a fight with somebody, and I didn't know what I'd done. But whatever I did, I knew it was terrible. I knew it was so terrible, and I would look at people's faces, trying to figure out what I had done, terrified to know and terrified not to know. And I felt so dirty and so full of shame inside of me. And yet I didn't know what to do with all those feelings. You see, I never knew what it was to have a normal feeling. I don't never, never knew how to bounce off of anything that I thought was normal. I just know that I reacted in the only way that I ever was able to react for whatever situation was in front of me. And in those days, I put a wall around me as a clown, you see, and I laughed about it, and I pretended that it didn't matter, but it always cut me to the quick of my soul, you see. And that's the way it always was with me whenever I drank. I went back to my mother shortly after because I had worn out my welcome over there where I had gone, and I always wore out my welcome in a short time. When I got back to my mother, she told me I couldn't come home. They'd been free of me over a year, and she and my stepfather didn't want me back. And, you know, I had a knot the size of my fist or my throat, where I was so terrified and wanted so much to be loved. I was so hungry to be loved, I would have given my heart to anybody that would have taken it. But I didn't know how to be, you see. I wanted her to love me and put her arms around me. And I said, I don't care, I don't care, I don't give a damn. And so I lived here and there and everywhere. 
I was just a child, really, 13 years old, but I was never a child. I looked at little girls today that are 13 years old, and I never was that young. I always felt old, and yet I was always a child in a woman's body with all these emotions that I didn't know what to do with. I started living here and there with anybody that would welcome me for a short time until the welcome would be pulled back. I, uh, I uh, discovered at this time the booze and the boys and the cha-cha-cha. God, in that order. Man, I was one of the original topless, bottomless dancers in them parties I used to go to. And I never got paid for it. And I, <laughs> I never remembered it. But you know, the girls always wanted to tell me what I did the next day. And so I used to beat them up. And then they didn't tell me. Because you see, violence is the only way that I ever learned to handle anything that was embarrassing, embarrassing and humiliating. I also don't know how to work. So I take up burglary. It's not very feminine. It just seemed like a good thing to do at the time. I really wasn't a bad person. It just was an exciting thing to do. Because, you know, I always like taking things that didn't belong to me. They were more exciting if they were yours. And after all, I didn't know how to get them the way you got them, so you wouldn't miss them. What, do you, what did I care? All that would need to be loved, to be wanted, and to be accepted turned to such anger and self-centered feelings about me that that you didn't matter, people didn't matter, and whatever I did was all right as long as it was me doing it. There was only one sin, and that's to get caught. And, you know, it really was a surprise to me when the state of California discovered me. Uh, they didn't understand that, that I was not a bad person, that I was just having fun. They took me before a judge, and he says, well, young lady, what do you think we ought to do with you? Well, you know, I, I can't tell him how I feel, so I said, well, you're the judge. You ought to know. And that was the wrong person to tell the, have that attitude with. So he sent me up to do a little bit of time for the state of California. Nine months isn't too long, really, but I don't know how to be good there either. And I do 13 months, on a, on going on nine months, and that scared me because I could just see me being the only gray-haired little old lady out of the girls' reformatory. When they finally let me out, I took my first inventory. Now, I don't have any education. I quit school at the eighth grade, and I don't have a job, and I don't have a home. I don't have anything going for me. So I started to think about solutions. I, don't, I didn't have any trouble looking for solutions. You know, today I hear things like you live in the answer, not the problem. I always knew about living in the answer. Uh, to me, today I recognize it to be scheming. And that's what I did. I started to think on a solution, and I thought, I better find me a husband to take care of me, because God knows I need taken care of. Now, there's a certain type of man that was very exciting to me for a very, very long time. He was the kind that had wore them, them T-shirts, you know, them, them body shirts, or the big muscles, and all the tattoos, and they were hunched over, you know, and they got that shine in the eyes that that uh, I used to think was charisma. Today I know it to be psychosis. <laughs> I want you to know that I have made amends to my daughter for picking that husband, uh, that father for her. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. I went looking for a husband in places that husbands have not to be looked for, and unfortunately for both of us, I found him. He was a dreamer like me. He also built them castles in the air, and I lived in them. And three months later, we were pregnant, and I was married in that order. I married a mainline heroin user, and you just don't live happily ever after with one of those. Very exciting, but not very happy. He had an idea of what a good Mexican wife should be, and I had an idea of what a good Mexican husband should be, and never the twain show me. And I got the scars to prove it, and he's got the scars to prove it. Now, he starts hearing all them stories about me and them bars and all those things that were happening to me before he came into the scene. And he doesn't want people talking that way about his wife. And I'm willing to straighten up. I want to be a good woman. I want to do all the things that, that they seem to do. So where he tells me I'm only going to drink when he lets me, and I want him to be the, the head of the house, right? Well, not for very long, but, yeah. And... um so he introduces me to little white pills with crosses on them because he knows I can't do without everything. So I don't know what they are, but I sure knew what they did to me. I had one eyeball over there and one over there, and I'd make baby clothes all night long. The same one, chew the inside of my mouth, uh, drink coffee, smoke cigarettes, sing, chew gum all at one time, clean the house with a toothbrush. God, I'll tell you. 
The most fantastic thing that I found out about benzodrine is that it controlled my blackouts. It was the answer. I used to they drive down the street there, and I used to see signs in them bumper stickers that say, we, I found it. Man, I found it. I know what they're talking about. There isn't anything like it in the world to be pulled in all directions at once. Because once I started taking uppers, I got to take downers, and I had to drink whatever it was that was working at the time to try to balance everything. And for 12 years, I was not to know what it was to, say, to have a sober day. Today I know, they, although it's not in the book, that though, that was one of the things that I used to control my alcoholism. You see, I always had to have something to kill that madness inside of me because I couldn't stand reality. By the time I had my baby, I realized this man didn't want to be married. As self-centered and self-rejecting that I was, I figured out he didn't want to be married to me because he had found that thing out, that thing about me. That everybody found out sooner or later. So when they placed that baby in my arms, I felt like finally, finally somebody belonged to me. You see, it is a, you know, those of you that are out there that can identify with this, that never having belonged to anybody and nobody ever belonging to me and this terrible need to have somebody when they placed that baby in my arms, I knew that nobody could ever take her away from me because she belonged to me. That baby inspired feelings within me that nobody ever has before or since, as you see. I would hold my baby by the hour, and I would promise her I would never beat her, abandon her, and discard her as I have been. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. If I could have been good for anybody, it would have been my baby because I wanted to shield her from all the pain that I had gone through. And as long as she had me, I felt that she would never suffer. But you see, I am an alcoholic, and I am a woman alcoholic. And when I drink, I have absolutely no choices and no rights. When I drink, I'm going to do what's in front of me to do. I don't know why I do all those things. I don't want to be bad. I don't want to do all those things that are embarrassing and degrading. I just know that it's in front of me to do, and I never know how to do anything any different. And I took that baby and her sister to places that children should not be taken because I'm an alcoholic. After the second one was born, I had one and then I had another one. And you know, my mother told me that I would be like a rabbit and have one every year. Yeah, I never remember that she ever said anything nice. I'm sure she must have said something, but I never remembered it. All I ever hugged to me was the rejection, was the fear, the, the, Things that made me feel that I was not wanted and unnecessary. And uh, I left him because I felt like I was going to get old. And I was 21, 22, and I felt ancient. So I went out and, and I took another inventory and I thought, Jesus Christ, I better go find me another husband. And so I went out looking for another husband. I, I didn't find another husband, but I fell in love. And I've always been in love. And when I fall in love, I fall in love all over my body. Every inch of me falls in love forever. I can't remember the names of some of the men I've fallen in love with forever. <laughs> I have a present husband. I usually don't give my last name because it's subject to change. <laughs> this present husband of mine, when I first moved over there and you're cleaning out drawers and stuff, I, I found a, an old anniversary card from him to my predecessor. And he said something about, I love you forever. And, and I laughed about it, and it embarrassed him, embarrassed him you know, that I should read this. And I said, honey, I know about loving forever. I, I always love forever. I love you forever or ten years, whichever comes first. You know? <laughs> There's no guarantee on anything. But at that time, of course, I, the guy I fell in love with was called CB, and that was his nickname. It stood for Crazy Bastard. And he was very, very exciting. And if I'd have continued to drink that way forever, I'd have never come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had five years of, uh, when I was an unprotected uh, woman alcoholic, I was an unprotected uh, bar drinking woman. I know the feeling of degradation and self-loathing that a woman alcoholic goes through when she's a bar drinker, and I was a bar drinker very, very young. So that is one of the things that I love about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, Johnny H. from Lakewood was one of the people that helped me so much 
with having a dignity and self-respect in this program, when he would say things to me like, every woman that walks into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous automatically becomes a lady. And deep down inside of me, I always wanted to feel like a lady, you see. And back then, I always felt so dirty. And that's why I love to be here with you so very, very much. And that I belong here is the greatest miracle for me. That I didn't fit in any place out there. I'm glad I didn't fit in out there. Because if I'd have fit in anywhere out there, I couldn't be a part of you. But I had quite a journey to go through yet. After five years of this type of life, my husband uh, had, was in Texas getting the cure. And he sent pictures and letters home saying, Babes, this time it's going to be different. And I was very tired. And so we made the Mexican Geographical. We moved about 20 miles from Mama. And we were going to be just like him other people and straighten up, this Dolphin and I. She says, I, I, I don't know, I guess I always wanted some little, uh, some little house in some corner of some barrio with, with the tortilla smells and the enchiladas and, and the slippers at five o'clock and the little kitties, you know, kind of a Mexican Aussie and Harriet type of <laughs> I always wanted that. We made this Mexican geographic. I married him in the Catholic, I married him in the Catholic Church. And that's going to any length for a Catholic, especially since he was a Methodist. I mean, I'll tell you I was going to make this work no matter what. We joined the PTA. And we did all those things that all them other people do. But you see, I'm a firm believer you can place me in the best of circumstances. And sooner or later, I have to create whatever is inside of me. Because it's inside of me I can't live. And it isn't long before he's making the run to his connection to Orange County. And I'm making the run to the wineries. The best thing I can say about Mira Loma over there by Norco and Riverside, it's in the middle of four wineries. I always loved wine. I didn't know you were not supposed to like wine. I just liked wine because it did the job for me. Wine or tequila. The other stuff had just got over there too fast. I always was trying to get to that place where I could have fun for a long time. But something happened to my drinking in that time. Where There was a time... When I, the more I would drink, it wasn't doing it anymore. No matter what I did, it wasn't doing the job anymore. I would drink and I drink and I drink and my body was drunk and my mind was in agony. It, I couldn't kill that madness inside of me anymore. And so I, when this, I blamed it all on this man because he, he hadn't fulfilled what he said that he was going to do for me. So I would go to my bedroom and drink round the clock. This is a time when I know what the words agony, despair, and utter loneliness are. I know those words. What, the way I learned everything in my life, the, the meaning of everything in my life, and my feelings in Alcoholics Anonymous. But in those days, all I knew is that I laid in a fetal position and rocked myself in my bed and cried out and cried out in agony. Because you see, I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober. I couldn't kill that madness inside of me. And what I did is I, I just knew that I couldn't, that nothing would ever change for me. And so what I thought is, I'm just going to kill myself. I can't stand it anymore. I couldn't stand that pain. I saved my sleeping pills and waited until this man was home one day, and I told him I was going to kill myself, and he said, all right. We went back to watching television. We had a slight communication problem. I went and took a bath because I wasn't taking very many baths, but everybody knows if you're going to commit suicide, you don't want them to know how you've been living. So I went and took a bath and went to bed. And I was in a coma for two days and two nights. And when I came to, I was enraged to be alive. You see, I couldn't drink and I couldn't be sober and I couldn't live and I couldn't die. And I fell in a pit of the loneliest day of my life, especially when I found out that this man had been in bed with me both nights while I was in that coma and never once did he take me so consider taking me to a doctor or to a hospital. He didn't care. I had, by this time, I had run off everybody near and dear to me. Nobody wanted to be around me. I had become so vicious. About that very day, there was a knock on the door. It was a lady from the PTA. If there's somebody I didn't want to see, it's a lady from the PTA. <laughs> but in a moment of weakness, I let her in and I tell her my tale of woe. And now you know I got a tale of woe. 
about this SOB and how he done me wrong. I never told anybody anything about me. I didn't know how to tell anybody anything about me. All I knew is that I'd have been all right if he had fulfilled what he told me he was going to do. And that SOB, and uh, the more I talked, this lady uh, asked me if I ever heard of al and I'd never heard of al but I got the idea that if I went there, he would straighten up. So she got me cleaned up and took me to al in defense of Alanon, I'd like to tell you that this lady had only been a member about two or three months, so she didn't know what to do with me except take me to where she was getting some help. And somehow I didn't belong in Alanon. I, uh, I felt a little bit like a whorewood in a nunnery. There was absolutely no identification between me and them square broads. But, you know, I remember that they put their arms around me. And I don't think that I could have come to Alcoholics Anonymous in any other way except that way because, you see, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I used to be an alcoholic until I cured it with all the pills. My problem is this SOB that ain't straightening up. And I could never find out, uh, find somebody that would, that always would mean what they'd say. I used to kiss all the princes and then they turned to frogs. Well, after a while, I don't want to go to Al-Anon, but I don't know how to say I don't want to go. And one day I heard something about release. I guess I heard a lot of things, but I never heard anything. And I went home and told him in detail how I was going to release him. So he used to sleep with his clothes on and a knife under the pillow. And as he'd be a dozy enough, I'd go take a little peek at him and he'd go, Whoa! That, that used to turn me on. Because uh, cause he always thought he was a real bad dude type of thing. He was uh, scared of me. And he would say unkind things to me. He'd say, baby, I may have a monkey on my back, but you got an orangutan. <laughs> and I think, how dare he bring me down to his level. I always thought he was so bad, he made me look good. We had a terrific marriage, I'll tell you. <laughs> One day I came home and he was gone. He took everything with him, and that's the way it had to be. Because though that life was unbearable, it was familiar. And fear has been the great compromiser of my life. You see, I'd have stayed there forever until I'd have killed him or forced him to kill me. Because, you see, sometimes that madness inside of me would be so bad that the only time I would have any peace at all was when I would, when I would hit him and he would hit me back. And he'd say, if you don't stop, I'm going to hit you. And, you know, it's just like they turned me on, you know. Well, hit me, you, and he always did. And I always lost every battle. I just never learned how to keep my mouth shut. Sooner or later, all my husbands have told me I'm a terrific lady if I didn't talk so much. If I'd only quit when I, when I was ahead. Well, I don't know how to be good. I still don't. And so anyway, um, at that time, the al lady took me to an AA meeting, and I'm thinking the al are trying to get rid of me. It embarrassed me that, they took, that she took me to the AA meeting because I felt that Alanons had found me out. And I walked into that young people's meeting in Pomona in August of 1964. And I walked into that room, sat in the back, and listened to the sounds of Alcoholics Anonymous. I listened to that belly laughter, that smile that reaches the soul, that shine in the eyes, and that happy talk. The very first thing that attracted me to you was what was happening between you. You see, because I had never heard it before. I had never knew what was in this room, had never heard it before. I often wondered, what is it and where does it come from? And it came to me one day, and I consider it a spiritual experience, when I realized that these are just empty rooms. That which happens in here, we bring it with us, every one of us, and it intermingles and becomes a group conscience, a higher power. You call it what? The side B of a table. Where is it and where does it come from? And it came to me one day, and I consider it a spiritual experience, when I realized that these are just empty rooms. That which happens in here, we bring it with us, every one of us, and it intermingles and becomes a group conscience, a higher power. You call it whatever you, are, you want, but there is a dynamic something that happens when you and I come together that is just incredible. But in those days, if you knew like I was, I didn't have what them people had. Way down inside of me, there was always a spark of the woman that I am tonight. But I thought that there was a monster that lived within me, that I couldn't be like the other people were, that I couldn't be what I wanted to be. But you see, I sat back there, and I let it wash over my soul. 
and I hungered for it. I wanted what these people had. I just thought it's too bad I'm not an alcoholic. If there's another name for the disease that you and I have, it's called I ain't got it. Now, I knew. I knew I was weird. I knew I was different, and I knew I was three steps ahead of the man with a butterfly net. I just never thought that I was an alcoholic, you see, because for me it had always been an answer to kill that madness inside of me. But you see, it, 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 I interpreted the only thing that ever, I ever interpreted anything. The only thing that ever caught my attention. I looked around at all them sober, single, good-looking young guys, and I said, man, I'm going to get me one of those. And I did. It was the sickest one there. He had to be. I had radar. You see, I was never enough just for me. I always needed somebody, somebody to hold me close and make that lonely, horrible something go away for a little while. And many times people interpret what I'm saying in, in a sexual connotation that has nothing to do with sex. It has everything to do with somebody to hold me close and let me be important to them. That's what it was about. And so I came around Alcoholics Anonymous for 10 months as a visitor. Because, you know, I was a reject from al And so I'd sit in those rooms, and when they'd go around the, the room, and everybody gave their name, and when it came to me, I'd say, I'm Angie, and I'm a visitor. Nobody ever said, you don't belong here. Somehow you understood it. They kicked in the teeth by life and rejected by everybody I'd come in contact with, and I couldn't have stood any more rejection. I couldn't have. I'd have been out that door and probably not come back. But you can see, you came around me and put your arm around me, and you said, keep coming back. I felt so warm when you would put your arm around me and tell me, keep coming back. What a disappointment it was to me when I found out you were telling that to everybody. (laughs) The higher power has only allowed me to see a little bit of illness at a time. I couldn't have stood the whole amount. I have been such an ill person. And many times, if you've been as arrogant as I have been, many times in my arrogance and my ignorance, I have gone around and said things like, some are sicker than others, and some are this or that than others, not knowing that those of us that have, that are we call so sick, it's because the hurt is so deep that it goes to the quick of the soul. And those of us are the sick ones. Those of us that have never fit in any place, that always felt apart from, and I know that I am not alone in this room in having had those feelings. But you know where I do the likes that you and I go, that where they will love and tell us keep coming back. I never found any place else. And so I kept coming back, and I heard, started hearing things, and I stopped drinking and doubled up in the mill towns and then the dreams are weirder. And this guy wanted to get rid of me, and I'm not easy to get rid of because I just sit and grow roots wherever I'm planted because I don't know how to move. He compromises me. And the day came when I had my first sobriety. And the way that happened is that this guy wanted to get rid of me, and so I, could, I couldn't let him until I moved to Pomona to be closer to the action. And I walked into a room one day, and there's a cute little boy talking with big blue eyes and brown hair, and I have an affinity for blue eyes and blonde hair. It is now blue eyes and gray hair because time marches on. But this little boy just talking to me. He just got out of white TS and he has big blue eyes and blonde hair and he's saying he doesn't have a girlfriend, he doesn't have a car. And I think to myself, come here, little boy, I'll take care of you. <laughs> and I did. I taught him everything he knows and today he's practicing at something else. But you see, I educated that young man on street drugs. He was 21 and I was 32 going on 82. Huh? But you see, after that relationship was over, he decided to become a minister. And I'd like to think that somehow in my small way, I helped push him over to God. <laughs> now, I don't like women and I don't trust men. And that don't leave you much. I had been I had been using everything that was in front of me for twelve years and I didn't know what I was going through so it was wrong. I never heard that word. I just thought you stopped and then you got to and you climbed them twelve golden steps to happiness and you lived happily ever after. 
Can you get on thinking that you think those steps are hokey? All you have to do is just come to me and you'll get it by osmosis. I thought I didn't know that you walked around without skin. I mean, that you everything is without skin. And at all hours of the night, or sometimes I go berserk. I don't know what you do when you go berserk, but I'll tell you what I do when I go berserk. I go berserk. I had a cat run away from home once because I went berserk. And I don't know how to do this thing that you say. I mean, this for you guys. You're know, those damn guys. And so I turned my will and my life over to the care of this guy, and when he got drunk, so did I. And it was not my, my worst drunk, but it seemed it was my most hopeless one. Because I knew alcoholics and women is worse, but it works for you. Everything always works for you. And when I came back to you, well, because of the end of the two weeks, I was so And I came back because one of you named Tyson, and then brought me back. And Tyson was a man that had a reputation on picking on the uh, new women. I don't know about him. He never picked on me. All I know is that he brought me back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the miracle for me is not that I've come to Alcoholics Anonymous, because hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people come and don't stay. The miracle for me is that I'm still here. And that last December the 22nd, I celebrated my 19th birthday. That is the miracle for me. Yeah. And it belongs to us, because you see, there are many people in this room that are in all this what holds me up. That is the love that you have held to me. This is what it is all about for me. You see, I belong to you. I do not belong to all the world And I'm so proud to tell you that I belong to an organization like you, that I paid a soul in life it is to be of most concern to our fellow men and to our higher power. And there isn't any life like the one that you and I have in this program. And my journey began. And it's been quite a journey. I tell you, if when I first came in, where before I had thought I was a little alcoholic, now I thought I was too alcoholic. The only thing that I've ever done with any, any, uh, I don't know if it's normal, but I smoke a pack of cigarettes a week. And my, my friend said, that's not normal either. And she says, why bother? And I says, I'm a social smoker. It's, it's a hard <laughs> When I came in this last time, and I said, it's my last time, there's a big thing to me. Rarely have you seen a person fail. I don't know about the rest of you, but when they say, well, rarely, I know somebody who didn't make it. And they say, they are such unfortunate, they are not upset, they seem to have been going that way. And I'm sure I knew I was going that way. My mother will tell you I was going that way. But a little further on down it says, and then there are those that have great emotional and mental disorders. I'm so grateful they have that in there. Because my sobriety sounds like some people drunk a lot. I can't live in a cold, dark room without any structure, without any guidance, without anybody to depend on. And all of a sudden come in here and fill up my love and be loud. It shouldn't be that way with me. I was so terrified. I was so terrified. But a little further on down it says, many of them do recover. Do they have the capacity to be honest? Now, I don't know if I have the capacity to be honest. I do know that the yearning of my heart is to do whatever my higher power has told me to do. Because I know I have been sick. I know like you have been sick. I have seen people like you and I die with the same disease. And we don't die easy. We die with a belly to the liver. Growing up our throat. And so slowly and saying, I you don't understand my face is different. And as we say, we say things, you're right, I'm never, 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 never going to drink again. And I don't feel like drinking. I don't go to very many meetings. But I don't feel like drinking anyway, so I'm never going to drink. I don't know why I know, but I am so grateful that I know that it really is true that we only have a daily reprieve, you see. Because I know how weird I am. I mean, I am so weird that I can tell... Uh, as soon as they say not to do something, I will do it. Now, I can go home and pray about it and meditate about it. And sooner or later, God and I will 
have decided to take will for me. I can do that easy. Because I don't know the difference between right and wrong. If I think it's right, it's right. It's right. I mean, if God knows it's right. Then God's response is that we're on it all for us. I have a sponsor that in our house, it's my life. God knows it. And what she says is law. Because if she knows me, she needs to say to the lady that will tell me, Angie, you don't have to sit in your own shit just because it's warm. I shall say yes. And when I call her with my guts hanging out and all this trouble to tell me, she says, she hates my feelings all the time. But she's the best thing I ask that ever happened to me, you see, because she, I feel love, total love and acceptance from this lady. And I didn't have any sponsor in the beginning. I didn't have any sponsor. God was my sponsor, and the group was my sponsor. Now, I still didn't like them in, and I ended asking them to be my sponsor. Ron had volunteered, and she told me things I didn't want to hear, so I gave up the sponsor, said, I knew how to live without her. And I uh, went on my way of total insanity. I mean, I had a lot of trouble the first five years of my sobriety with depression, violence, going berserk, just everything like that. And I didn't know how to talk about my insights. I had a lady after two years, I got married with a few young thing. Knowing one day he'd leave. Because I said, that, that father had told me that. So uh, what I did is when I got married, then I became respectable and got a sponsor. And I, what I did is I looked around for the expert sponsor. And she was over 23 years and she talked to me in Greek. I didn't know what she's talking about. I just smile a lot and tell her, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know what a sponsor is. So even though I had worked for steps and taken inventories, I still was not in touch with who I was. I remember one time I came home uh, and told my, my little husband there that, that my life was totally dependent upon my higher power. And he told me, well, if there's anything that's a lie, that's it. So that was good for a big battle. When I was uh, sober about five years, I chased him around the house with a hammer in one hand and a knife in the other because I was going to uh, fix dinner for Daddy and Johnny A. And I didn't know how to handle having company like that, so... He had a big fight, fight and I chased him and he locked himself in the bathroom and I broke the bathroom door down with a hammer and he jumped out the bathroom window. I mean, it was normal for me. Well, the day came when all my chickens came to roost when I was over that five and a half years. My kids started drinking and taking drugs. And uh, I went into a depression, and I again contemplated an attempt at suicide. That young man went and took me to the psycho ward, went home, packed his clothes, and left me. And everything that I ever feared came about. I was the best me I'd ever been, and I was still a failure at the business of living. And you see, something happened to me. The reason that I stand before you tonight is because my higher power has had other plans for me. And it was the people in Alcoholics Anonymous that came around me and held me up when I was so devastated. You shared the secrets of your heart with me, and I shared the secrets of my heart with you. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, we learned to be each other's mama. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned to be a woman, and I learned that I was really not so different from you. Maybe the situations were different, but the feelings were the same. And it is from the men in Alcoholics Anonymous that have treated me like a lady, that I've learned to be a lady. I went to one of you named Dave, and I said, Dave, what is wrong with me that I can't seem to form a one-to-one relationship? And he held me close and said, you're a beautiful, warm, loving lady, and one day you will know the reason. So I went home and got on my knees, and I said, thank you, God, for showing me the reason. Bring him back. And he didn't come back. So I said, screw them all, let them do what the goddamn please, I'm tired. I don't know about the rest of you, but for me that means surrender in the only language I understand. And I made peace with my higher power because I knew that it was all his fault. I said, okay, God, you never want me to be happy again. All you ever want me to do is work with a sick woman alcoholic and let them puke on me. All right, all right. And so I threw myself completely and absolutely into this program without any reservation, knowing I'm never going to be happy again. 
And I don't know about your higher power, but mine has a weird sense of humor. Because so that is the reason that I walked so with dignity and self-respect tonight, because when I got to the other side, when I got over the bitterness, when I got over the feelings of having been betrayed, I touched the power and a strength that was within me that has sustained me to, to today and goes on and on. Because, you see, what I demanded of them people, they never had it to give. They never had it to give. The only one that ever fills up them empty places is my higher power. I know today that you and I do not come together by accident. I believe that we come together by divine appointment. By divine appointment. But that every relationship is beginning in its party. That's not to say that I enjoy parties, parties even today. But when you go on your way, you take a little bit of me with you, and you leave a little bit of you behind, they were never the same because our lives have touched. And our higher power, my higher power, has always seen that somebody else comes along, that it, that it is always new and it's always fresh, the sweet love that you and I have for one another. But I didn't, I found that out then. I didn't know it in the early part, so I have forgiven myself for not having been able to walk the way I wanted to walk. I thought that you climbed in 12 golden steps to happiness, and you got a diploma after each step, and you never have to go back again. Well, I find out that that isn't the way it is. The more I grow, the wider the horizon, and the narrower the road. You see, and uh, my children came back one at a time, and they went to work, and Good me to school, and I became self-supporting through my own contribution. And I kept falling in love, and I decided one day at a time I don't drink, and one day at a time I don't steal, and one day at a time I don't get married. Because, <laughs> because I didn't know that happiness was on the other side of marriage. And I started saving my money for my old days. And I used to wonder... What would happen the, other, the next time another crisis comes into my life? That comes to everybody sooner or later. And I had that opportunity to find out where I was. Because my sister, the one that had always been held up as a perfect example for me, chose to take her life, and it was my destiny to be the one to find her. And I could not believe what was before my eyes. Death had never touched my life that close. And I wanted to explode. But something came together inside of me that said, God is the only giver and the only taker of life. She chose to go and he let her go home. How many times did I want to die? I never wanted to live. Never. Dying was not what I was afraid of. She was living that I was afraid of. And somehow to her death, I realized that it had been a long time since I had wanted to die. I also found out that we really are temporary. That life really is now, today. That if I yearn for tomorrow and regret yesterday, I will miss the now. And so it has become easier for me to stay in the now since that happened in my life. Because life is always light and already is heavy, I can see the lightness also. Two weeks after my uh, sister killed herself, I became a grandma. God, and I don't know about you, but... I was a failure as a mother, but as good as a grandma. I mean, I can hold myself up to any grandma. And two little girls thought grandma and Santa Claus were synonymous. They are now eight and ten, and it's no big deal if they have a grandma anymore. And I would like to have another little kid to, to snow under. When they, uh, one time, they, they're easy. They just really are easy. They just... To give them things and to hug them and kiss them a lot. They don't want anything else till they get bigger. Uh, one, one time, one time Lorraine brought them over to my house and we ran out of milk and so I had some powdered milk and poured milk in, uh, water into this and, and she went running to her mother and she said, Mom, Grandma makes milk out of water. <laughs> The same little girl, the oldest one, the one that was born two, year, two weeks after my my sister killed herself, went with me to a conference, and I was dressing up with her there, and she, I put on a long, a white blouse with flared blouse that covers a multitude of the things of the present, and a white pants, and she looked up at me with little shining eyes and said, Grandma, you look just like the white angel. 
And she looked at me with those little eyes and that little face so shiny with all that love, you see. She has seen the miracle that you have done with my life. She never has had to see her grandma looking like a monster so beat up. She never has had to see her grandma crawling around in her own field, you see. She's always just seen that you have done with my life. And I could never have unraveled it without you. Today I, li- I can live in peace with myself most of the time. I moved to life. I told you to be with this man that I fell in love with. Uh, and uh, he is a terrific man. He is the first poet I ever kissed that became a friend. I mean, he, te- he tells me that I'm the greatest person that's ever happened to him. How much he loves me. He tells me that from scratch. I don't have to chase him now around the house asking him, do you love me, do you love me, you see. We are both so dedicated to the same thing, and that's to making me happy. Yeah? <laughs> he tells me I'm the greatest cook in the world, so I'm over there cooking, you know. So I left home, I made all this food for him to, to throw in the microwave. He says, Gordon's house never looks so clean, so I'm over there scrubbing clothes. He says, I've got my shirt, so I'm over there ironing. <laughs> he inspires this in me. <laughs> the miracle is that he does not own me. You see, once I, there was a part of me that can't be owned anymore because I know that we come together by divine appointment. I am grateful tonight that I have my daughter that is that is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for over four years here tonight. I have another daughter. I have another daughter, my youngest, that is still out there. And she's out there, and I don't know where she is. And I haven't known where she is for many, many months. But you see, I know that the same power that brought us into this program is out there watching for her. And I don't know what road she has to go to to get to where she's going. I do know that my my job is to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, to be an example that this program works. That this program works for the likes of me that came from the far country. And he has touched my life. And he did the same for you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.